It's a while since I've done a project build, so let's build something unusual. Let's build something that you can't buy. Actually, I say you can't buy this, but I did, while I was uh, preparing the stuff for this video, I just thought, I'm going to check online. I'm going to check on eBay, and I found a vintage set from about, oh, 1930s, 1960s, eh, a long time ago anyway. And it was a set of neon Christmas lights. And they used to sell a couple of types. That st set was styled with little candles, but with mains voltage neon indicator lamps. There was another version that was sold that had phosphor uh, spheres with the gas discharge inside and they weren't very bright but they're kind of collectible now because they just glow very gently with a sort of sinister phosphor glow. Very nice. Um, I've not got a set of those but you know what we can all have a set of these neon ones because we can make them ourselves. So here is the plan. Let's bring in a notepad and just doodle something down quite quickly. The idea is to get uh, one of the little neon lamps. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that'll do as a neon lamp with a little pinch seal at the bottom and the little sort of pip at the top. And there are the electrodes inside. And the electrodes come through and I'm going to cut the wires short. I'm going to tack on some resistors. And just for the ease of construction and for power dissipation, I'm going to put a resistor on each lead. And the resistor in this case is going to be 100K times two. Uh, in... Countries with 120 volt supply, I think it's a 39k is normally, so you could probably get off with 2 times 22k uh, for 120 volt. But you check the resistor rating recommended for the neons you're using, and then sort of half it because you're using two of them. So there's the resistors, and I'm going to bring in the leads, and I'm going to solder the leads, and they're going to loop out because it's going to be mains voltage going all the way along. In this case, it's going to be 240 volts going all the way along. And to keep these apart, I'm going to use these little plastic spacers. And these spacers are out of a set of bog standard LED Christmas lights. They're used because they're quite easy to use in the manufacturing process. And it looks like a little H beam like that. Um, and I'm going to sit the resistors and the wires in either side. And I'm going to bring them down so that those spacers in there actually extend down to the mains wire because we don't want those wires shorting together and want to keep the resistors apart. And then I'm going to put the whole lot under heat shrink. So I've made a little prototype. Let's put that out of the way. This is also going to be a questions and answers type video, but it's going to be some of the things, some of the questions I didn't spot were popping up on the recent Friday Night Clive uh, live stream. So let's start by turning the soldier iron on so it's red in the background. You'll hear it humming in the background. And let's get a sharp blade, and I've got a couple more of the LEDs in this string of lights, so I want a sharp knife, like this one, which I'm going to use to just slit gently the heat shrink sleeving around these low voltage uh, standard parallel string of lights. So I'm going to put a wee slit in the heat shrink, then I'm going to get uh, retract the blade for safety. I'm going to get a pair of snips. And then I'm going to kind of cut that uh, heat shrink off where I've split it. And if you have split it correctly, that will sort of separate. This is where it all goes horribly wrong, as it usually does. And you'll be able to pull out. This is just, you know, there's nothing quite like starting the camera to make things difficult. But there is the little spacer. I'll just leave that uh, heat shrink on that LED. No, I'll just use brute force and rip it off. And the other one, that'll be those two spacers out. I'm not sure how many lights I'm going to make. I, I randomly cut a batch of wires all the same length and I stripped them so I, I didn't count. So it will just be a case of uh, of doing it until I run out or run out of questions or whatever. I suppose that if we were being really traditional with the sort of old school Christmas lights, we'd go for something like 20 uh, lights. Although ultimately the very earliest sets of lights had very small numbers like 5 or 12 lights. Uh, these, this string of lights, I'll maybe desolder these because these are the nice side emitting LEDs and I'll use them for something else later on. But in the meantime, they have yielded the bit we want. The little sort of h beamy type bit that's going to be used as a separator. Here are the resistors. Uh, here are the neons. The neons are typically called NE2 lamps, and they've got quite long leads. Things worthy of note, you're not supposed to solder too close to the end of the to the glass uh, capsule, but in that case, um, I will be soldering quite close, but I'm going to grip them in the 
uh, the magic helping hand things or magic arms helping hand. It's not a magic arm, it's helping hand type things. Just as a heat sink and also just to hold them in place. So I've cut the wires probably about 8 millimeters is actually quite generous, but that'll do. Maybe less. The resistors I'm using are standard quarter watt. 100k resistors and then the heat shrink I'm using is in this case it's called 6.4 millimeter heat shrink because well I don't know because it's actually over 7 millimeters diameter outside diameter and it shrinks down really quite it shrinks down to about 3 millimeter inside diameter so I don't know why they call it 6.4 I think it's just a provisional sum but it's just the right size for these so let's start making the lights. So I shall flip that round like that, tin those leads one at a time so I don't overheat the junction and I shall start answering some of the questions that were asked that I didn't answer. First question, Brogan Harley says, Clive, why do you start your stream so late? I can barely stay awake. I am very nocturnal. Right now it's about 3.30 in the morning and uh, it's just I'm kind of nocturnal also I consider I try to allow for what time it is around the world I'm, I'm lying I, I haven't a clue what time it is around the world when I start my live streams but ultimately no matter where you are in the world it'll be yeah it'll be sometime during the day that's not a very good answer is it that was vague they're never planned it just happens and it just so happens that they happen late. So I've tinned the neon and I've tinned the resistor lead and then reflowed them together. Now I've turned over to the other lead and I'm tinning that lead and I'll tin the other resistor and I'll solder that on. Like this. A bit too much solder in the solder iron, but that's okay, it's a, a rather moist tip. Excellent, a little blobby bit there, but that's fine. It's a clean blob. That's the main thing. Next question. Colm R89 says, any experience with the ESB in Ireland wanting, waiting to see if I'm accepted for an apprenticeship? The, the ESB in Ireland is a sort of electricity board over there. I hope you get your apprenticeship. That'd be quite good to get in with. Uh, any big electrical utility company is probably quite good to have an apprenticeship with. That's a good thing, so I hope you do get in with that. So, one of the things I considered when I was putting this neon arrangement together was to individually sleeve the resistors if I didn't have these little spacers, but I think the spacers are a good option here. So this is going to be the end neon. So I'm just going to solder a single wire on. Usually it will be two twisted together and then uh, soldered on. But in this case, because it's the last one, I'll just put a single layer of, well, a single wire in. And I'm going to tin them before I crop them down to size because that holds the strands together. And I shall tin the resistor leads. I'm not too bothered about the uh, heat going up to the neon now because the resistors are sort of acting as a little separator for that. And then I shall reflow these leads on. There's one flowed on. I would say take good care when you're flowing these leads on to make sure they're properly soldered. You don't want these wires popping out. As it is, the wire I'm using is fairly standard electrical wire. It is rated for mains voltage, but it's not double insulated like Christmas lighting wire should be. Let's um, stick this little insulator piece in, this little H-shaped beam. Put it up so it's just a few millimetres below, or eighth of an inch below, the solder joints. And then we'll get a bit of heat shrink. Let's see, what sort of length would be quite good here? Just over an inch, inch and a quarter, about four, 30 millimetres maybe? That sounds about right. And this is where I'm going to use the heat gun. In a way, uh, I suppose really it might have been nicer actually taking the having the leads closer to the neon, but I don't think it really matters that much. Let's bring in the heat gun. 
and shrink this down. I'll just move it down a tiny bit just because I want to cover, make sure that the wires at the bottom are kind of gripped against that little plastic insert. Since it is acting effectively strain relief, this would not be compliant in the UK with Christmas lighting regulations, but then again, there you can't get the neon indicator Christmas lights, so it's just kind of we're making things up here. Perhaps not the sort of thing you'd want a small child to suck upon. So that's a... Let's get the first two there. Excellent. Let's grab another neon and crop it down. And ask the next question. Let's crop these very marginally shorter. I'm just wanting enough that I can actually grip them in the, the helping hand and still leave enough room to solder. So that looks pretty good. The fan will cut off shortly, it's just, uh, it always runs on a wee bit longer. As it cools down. And it's cutting off now. Couple of resistors. Always worth checking the value of the resistors. In this case, brown, black, yellow. Brown, black, yellow, 104. That's one zero and four zeros is 100,000 ohms. Doesn't matter which way around the resistors go, they're not polarised. Flow a bit of solder on. And the next question. Um, Pascal Dorland said, What is your favourite whiskey? And to be honest, I don't have a specific favourite whiskey. I'm not posh enough, like my brother, to appreciate fancy whiskies. So I tend to go for supermarket whiskey, one of the classic supermarket blends. Because to be honest, it tastes very good to me as whiskies go. I'm not an aficionado. Likewise, you know, gin and rum, I'll tend to go with the supermarket blend because ultimately I'm going to be mixing it with other drinks anyway and that's just sacrilege with things like whiskey that are quite complex drinks to make. That is a huge blob of soda. But that's okay. It's not pointy. That's the main thing. I do. One of the things that uh, it could happen here is if you had a pointy soda joint, it could pierce through the... Uh, heat shrink as some of those cheapy Chinese sets do. This is absolutely inf infinitely superior in every way to those cheapy Chinese sets that you can buy for about five bucks from eBay. Mains voltage lights that just have so little insulation the wires can literally pull out the controllers and it's, it's the thinnest wire imaginable. So this time I've got another wire I'm going to twist this on I'm going to solder them and then crop it after I've soldered. The reason for that is just if you crop it before soldering, there's a chance it may sort of uncoil a bit um, when you cut it, after you've cut it. And uh, the other thing is if you cut it before soldering, you'll have end, end up with lots of tiny little copper strands everywhere, which get in your feet. They, they actually end up in your footwear. And yeah, MD who's... Uh, does electronics at home will have had a bit of wire or a component lead pierce their footwear or sock in the past and it's not pleasant. Or you go to bed and you find up you've got a really itchy bit because there's a there's a wire clipping has found its way into the bed with you. Those pesky wire clippings. I can hear bird song outside that means that actually it's not. The sunlight is not coming up yet. Usually that's the first sign of dawn, but they might see it differently. They might see that dawn is rising. Next question. Zachary Bennett asks about blue LEDs causing eye damage. Um, not so sure about that. I suppose if you look directly into any LED, it's going to risk causing eye damage if it's a bright source, but the same could be said of halogen. And nothing can compare with actually being outside in a typical sunny day and just reflections of the sun. You know, nothing is going to compete with that. A lot of it is kind of weirdly, it's people making a job for themselves. Research scientists who are trying to keep themselves busy. It's like these people that say blue LED blue light keeps you awake at night and disrupts your sleep rhythm. No, I think you'll find it's the fact that you're on Facebook and YouTube that's disrupting your sleep rhythm there. 
So let's uh, pop this in here. I could put the heat shrink over this now with the fan, or I could just do them all at once. Will I do them all at once? It, it probably a good idea, really. Although that will probably fall apart now. Let's twist the next wires on. And ask the next question. Shiggy dig... What? Shiggy dig digger digerino. Have you ever worked played around with laser? Yes, I have. I was, was an early adopter of laser technology. I, my first laser was a helium neon laser. A velamin helium neon laser. Very good. Very long lasing cavity. And because it's uh, about... Um, what is it, 650 nanometer, 635 nanometer I think it is, it produces a very vivid orangey beam of light that was visible and travelled for a very long distance. I was being a nuisance with lasers long before that became fashionable. Firing them in tower blocks and things in Glasgow from a great distance. They'd have been diffused, they would, the beam would have spread by them, but you could still even see that measly half milliwatt of light uh, playing up and down the buildings and going in between the windows, not through the windows, obviously. Probably. I did chase people along the street with a laser beam because laser beams are new. It probably intimidated them. Oh dear, I'm such a terrible person. Said Clive, showing no sign of remorse whatsoever. Let's crop these down. Bring this in. Grip the lead that I'm going to solder. And flow some solder onto it. Tinning the lead, just preparing it, just getting some solder on that before the main soldering happens. It saves actually trying to flow the solder directly onto the joint when you're holding the bits together. Ideally, the correct way to terminate these would be to position them in little grips and then flow the solder in, but it's just easier. If you're doing it by hand just to pre-tin the leads and then reflow them, the risk is that because the flux is evaporated off by the time you do this, it may result in a spiky soda joint. You can fix that though by adding a bit of flux again. But in this case it's all going to plan, which is nice. Let's get the other lead there. My apologies if, 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 uh, if this is looking small. It's just there's, I could zoom in, but uh, will I zoom in a little bit? Yeah, let's zoom in a tiny little bit. And then I'll try and stay in shot. Hopefully it is in focus. It's always hard to tell. Even though I've got a modestly sized screen, it's never quite the same as if I'd seen it on a huge high definition screen. Touch a solder on that and flow it onto there. Excellent. So I shall crop those leads. Ready for soldering the wires on, I shall grip that in the clip and tin those and solder the wires on. I won't even put the spacer in this time because uh, we'll do that all at the end. When we're putting the heat shrink across all of them, that way it avoids the fan noise all the time. Okay, okay, so this can go on here. The little uh, H beams of plastic, they're kind of I can understand. If you see the these LED strings, the parallel LED, LED strings being made, you can understand why they use that. It's just a very easy spacer for them to insert, and it keeps the wires separate to avoid them shorting out inside the uh, soldered assembly. It's very clever, the machines that make the strings of lights. They're very ingenious. Next question. Um... Rog Rogley says, have you tried the honeycomb twin peaks from Poundland? Nectar. I have to say, I've seen the honeycomb twin peaks and I was very tempted, but you know what? The problem with the twin peaks is they're very, very good. They're very nice chocolate. It's good quality chocolate. And there's a lot of it. And if I buy one of those bars, I will eat the whole bar. So I have to exercise extreme self-control when I'm in Poundland with regards to their delicious chocolate bars. Mmm. Otherwise it would be Twin Peaks all the way. So let's uh, get a couple of resistors on here. 
I'll just solder the resistors on whichever way they end up. Here we go. Next question. That transistor asks, what Chromebook do I have? It's an Acer Chromebook with the 15.6 inch display. I just got the biggest display I could. And I have to say the Chromebook is fast. Compared to the Windows laptop, because it is basically just a browser, it is super slick. Also, something that's not mentioned much these days is uh, the Chromebooks can also run Android apps now. So, say for instance, FL Studio. Footy Loop Studio uh, can run in your Chromebook. If you've bought that app, it's quite handy. I'm not sure how well it runs, I've just doodled with it a little bit, but uh, it's just nice that it's there in the first place. It's the music app I used to create the music with on the iPad until the, those fateful updates that uh, rendered it unusable for music because it was stuttering and stopping because uh, bloatware and also just older hardware. I think the operating system is largely responsible for that though. I think it was just getting a bit saddled up with stuff in the background. Questions. Ah, Bobby Duke Arts asks, what is my favourite shortbread cookie? And the answer to that is it's quite hard to have a shortbread cookie that's bad, although some companies do actually manage that. They make shit shortbread cookies that taste, they're supposed to be kind of, proper shortbread is supposed to be buttery flavoured. But um, you can get some really cheap, nasty ones that it's basically, they might as well be water flavoured. It's like really bland and unexciting. Fortunately, those are quite rare. Even the cheapest supermarket shortbread is usually pretty good. It's probably butter flavouring, but hey, it works. Again, I don't get a lot of shortbread because, once again, if I got a packet of shortbread, I'd eat the whole thing. That's the peril of uh, cookies. They're so delicious. They're so Moorish. The more you, well, you get a packet, you can't just eat one out of the packet. It's just not really feasible because as soon as you've eaten one, you get the immediate urge to eat another one, which is the whole point. That's why they mix fat and sugar in those proportions. Next question. Um, Mr. H says, Clive, would you consider yourself a hoarder? I think most technical people are hoarders. We, it's not junk, it's just, it's very, when, you, when you're at work and you remove a faulty piece of equipment, but you know the potential of repairing it or scavenging it for components, you tend to hoard. It's just how it is. And just nice stuff you see in, say, markets and stuff like that, or old technical equipment that you find quite interesting. And it just tends to build up because you don't really want to throw it out because it's, uh, it still has use. Next new one. Um, Adam Trows. Can you tell me why Scotland is the only place you seem to get red cola? I wasn't aware of that. Red cola is a fizzy cola drink, which has a distinct fruity taste. It's red and, uh, well, as the name implies, and I don't know if it was designed to be a competitor to... What, did it predate Coca-Cola? But it's a completely different taste. It's quite a fruity, sweet taste. It's quite nice. I quite like red cola. Like cola cubes also have that nice taste. It's very deep and complex. Cola cubes being a sweet over here, or candy, which is a little sugar cube, hard sugar cube, dusted in sugar, and it's flavoured with either, you get the pineapple cubes and you get the cola cubes. Other flavours too, I guess. I've, I've only ever seen the pineapple and the cola. It's a very straightforward confection. It's just a standard boiled sweet, but in a particular style. A little bit of soda on the resistors here. And flow. Ah, that's hot. Mainly because I've just melted metal onto it. Join this together and then put the clip over there and flow some soda onto that and do that one too. 
Actually, I'll just turn that right round, so it, uh, I'm definitely getting a good clamp to take that heat away. You can get colours of neons where they're not as efficient as the, the classic orange neon. I'm not sure what gas is using them, it might be argon, it might even be a tiny sniff of mercury vapour or something, but they tend to glow, uh, you tend to get them in blue or green, but you could get white ones in the past. I've left a tiny little tail of solder in that, I shall clip that off so that the heat shrink doesn't penetrate through it. Or it doesn't penetrate through the heat shrink. And I shall clamp that in and I shall get another set of wires ready. This shouldn't take too long because I've only got a fixed number of wires, but I shall keep uh, I shall keep going through the questions as well. So let's uh, solder that. Hopefully I have focused at the correct height, I think I have. I should be focused around about this height here. Next question. Mm. Ah, Noswolf Cop says, Hi Big Clive, you said something about some people was made to work and some for other, and you truly changed my life with that and made me understand my place in life. You know, that applies to a lot of people. There's, I often, often said that, you know, there are types of people who, in life, that are kind of optimised for work, and it's all they do. Even in the recreational time, they're doing stuff like this. They're tinkering and watching YouTube, technical channels on YouTube, just learning more technology. It's just how it is. We're just optimised for that. And when you realise that, you know, there is this thing that Mother Nature probably has, a specific type of human designed to build and maintain society and, and not breed or stuff like that, um, then it just kind of, life does make a bit more sense. And then if you can understand that, you just enjoy what you are, just born to build and take stuff to bits and tinker. Let's uh, get this soldered on here. And that one soldered on. There, at some point I'm going to end up mixing wires up and then short it out halfway along the set and plug it in, there'll be a loud bang. Which is amusing in its own right. Dangerous fear lights, I can go bang at any length in the set, that's quite good, that's what we want. So how many? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six neons in already, that's quite good. I may make this just a ten neon set. Next question. Alan Toop says, has Poundland staff noticed you when shopping in store? Yes. They quickly twigged that it was me who did the Fanny Flambeau video. And every time it goes viral on Facebook, which is approximately two or three times a year, they get people in asking if they've got the doll that shoots flames out at its arse. That's nice. And the first time it happened, they didn't have a clue what was happening. Because up to that point, nobody had asked about a doll that shoots flames out its arse. People didn't realise. Well, the, the actual, the YouTube video had a description. It had said in the description, if you read it, that it was fake and it was just a joke and it was made out of Poundland components. But people, when they saw it on Facebook, didn't see that. And obviously it was convincing enough that people thought it was real. People still think it's real. And express outrage that this toy is available for small children. It's an outrage. I'm surprised nobody's actually made a Fanny Flambeau for adults. That'd be quite good. You'd think they would uh, make a nice, dangerous, scary doll. It would sell well. I should mention that Pound, uh, Poundland, I don't think they've done the sort of flaming cake fountains that I used in the up Fanny Flambeau's but in that video, but uh, Pound World, which has been reincarnated as one below, uh, they do seem to have those. I've left a little whisker on there, I'll maybe just nudge that down, soften that, oh that's not helping at all. Excellent! I'll just crop that little whisker off then. Is that looking good? It's looking fine. Let's crop those down. And grip it and sew to the wires on. But yeah, I think uh, Poundland were mostly bemused by it because it was just such an odd thing. They thought it was funny more than anything else. 
it would have been a bestseller if they actually had sold uh, smoking pussy gang ca- cast members in their range of toys. Uh, they'd have to make it really clear it was only for adults, though. But they have that option at their tills already that it'll only sell to adults. I found that out when I bought vibrators for this channel. And uh, yeah, it sets off an alarm at the till. Nice, that's that's good. And then they come out momentarily from their trance-like state of scanning stuff through to look at what's just set their arm off and then they sort of stare at me and go, oh, this big guy has just brought a vibrator. Excellent, that's just what I wanted. Yeah, lots of attention. Let's crop that down and solder it on. And the next question. Uh, Marcus Soinen, drunken greetings from Finland. Drunken greetings from the Isle of Man. I have been... I went to the gym today, and then after the gym, it's during the TT at the moment, so the pubs are all a bit busy, and... Uh, I went to the pub just for a pint of cider, intending to have one pint, and discovered some friends were there. Local friends who were recently performing at Sprint Fest, doing the lighting for Sprint Fest, and also uh, performing on stage at Sprint Fest. Very good, good music. It's a local uh, event they've got here in Ramsey, on the Isle of Man, that it's just the first time they've tried it. It's just really to provide entertainment for bikers who are staying through here in Ramsey. And it was good. I didn't realise, and it, they had a sort of country westerny type theme, I did not realise just quite how many Dolly Parton songs I knew. They're so catchy. And kind of I remember the, them popping up in Top of the Pops, uh, in amongst all the sort of standard pop music, the folk type songs would come in as well. The country and western stuff. Willie Nielsen's, things like that. Yes, iconic tracks. Resistors. Next question. Matako, how tall are you? Six foot four inch, which is approximately 1.93 metres. So fairly tall. I've noticed that strange thing. The Dutch are getting bigger and bigger. There's something... I wonder why, specifically in Holland, but the Dutch are really growing very tall. It must be part of their diet in some way. I'm not really sure. This is good. It means that uh, Dutch overalls and other clothing are much taller fit, which is great news for me. That resistor's hot again. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll learn by the end of the video not to hold freshly soldered resistor ends. You'd think I'd know by now. Or maybe I will never learn. Little sploosh of soda on here. The previously molten hot resistor, which has now cooled. This uh, is a bit loose. I may have to glue that on or something, or jam it on. It's got. This is one that's got a metal pin out the middle of the sort of crocodile or alligator clip here. But uh, it's better than the ones that just try to crush it in a little grip, which uh, usually just kind of like it tends to work loose quite quickly. This one's not too bad, but it still needs uh, worked on. Oh, that's terrible, but it's all right. It'll f it's fine. Crop the lead down a bit. Next question. Um, Alphonse Jean, wait... Is that sunlight? Oh, right, okay, that was the fan light thing. Now, I thought that the lights in the tenement flats, because that was uh, filmed at the tenement flat in Glasgow, and tenement flats have these little windows above the doors, and it's to allow light, natural daylight, to sort of at least some light to get into the place so you don't need to rely on candles and stuff, because that's ultimately when they were first built. I thought it was called a quarter light. Someone pointed out that is the little... Uh, window in your vehicle next to the wing mirror. Uh, so the correct term is a fan light because they used to be sort of fan shaped. They work very well. They're quite stylish. It does indeed let some of the light shine in from outside. Not a huge amount, but I suppose given when the, those tenements were built, it would be still quite a lot that was coming in compared to 
Well, they didn't have electric light, I guess, in the first days. The, those tenements uh, in Glasgow are just really, really old, hundreds of years old. They were built quite big back then because uh, a lot of people stayed in the tenements. Uh, though the one, uh, the flat I have there, um, it was presumably designed for a more upmarket household because it does have a maid call system, the remnants of it in the attic. The sort of, you pull the plush cord and it rings a bell somewhere and the maid comes running through to give you a cup of tea or whatever it is. It's just a set of little metal cantilevers. I've seen them while working in other buildings as well. It predates, or does it predate, the electric systems which uh, you push the button and it called, or it used the little, it rang the bell electrically and jiggled the flag mechanically with this little solenoid. But they ran off uh, Le Clanche cells, I believe. I found a Le Clanche cell in a, an old building. A bunch of them, in fact, but they were all cracked. They'd all... Uh, the electrolyte, the salamoniac, had just it had dried out and sort of expanded. Next, Neon, next question. Justice for Seth Rich WWG1WGA says... Your room look like mine. Yes, cluttered in other words. This is it, you know, surround yourself with stuff. It's it's human nature to have a hoard. Uh, that was an interesting thing when my mother developed Alzheimer's. Uh, she displayed characteristics that a lot of people with Alzheimer's have. Like, for instance, she would go out and gather stuff. And you hear this thing about humans being hunter-gatherers. It's absolutely true. They they gather stuff and bring it back to their cave. So if you hoard stuff, it's because you're a human. And normal, proper humans hoard stuff. And if your house is spotlessly clean, then... Ooh, I think you need to get yourself a hoard. eBay is your friend for that. I'm going to need more soda. Have a wee bit here? I've got a wee bit here. I'll use this first. Use all the dribs and drabs of soda up first. Um, let's see. Uh, let's next question. All right, okay. DMAC2. I need a mini heat gun like the one you use. What is that you have? It's a very common type. The Yahua 8786D is the station I use. It's just because it, it had both functions. It was cheapened. When you buy these uh, soldering stations, you have to remember that they're not necessarily compliant with the electrical standards of your country. It's worth checking things like the quality of the plug that's been supplied and things like that, and making sure the earth is connected right through, and it's worth a little look inside. If you want one that's completely compliant with your country, buy it from a known source. In the UK, that would probably be CPC or, or Rapid Electronics. And that way you're going to get something of known quantity. Known quality, you mean. How's that slightly peaky? I'll crop that little peak off again. It's just because I'm not using, I'm not flowing it on directly. The flux is drying out a little bit. It just makes that a little bit easier to actually put it together. Crop that down, put it back in, and then sew the wires on. Once you start making this, you know, it all flies together. It's just a matter of getting into the sort of pattern, the sort of the rhythm, if you will. Next question, um, Xavier or Xavier, what are your thoughts on disposable downlights? The downlights that are supplied these days that you can't change a lamp in them, you throw the whole thing out. It's a bit of an ecological disaster. That applies to so many LED lights these days, massive chunks of aluminum or aluminium that are just binned. It's a bit of an ecological disaster in that sense. There's so much more going into landfill, whereas before... It would have been a glass lamp. It would be nice if the manufacturer standardised on modules that went into these. And to a degree, I suppose, they have standardised modules. It's nicer if you use a GU10 type fixture because you can change the lamp. But having said that, 
The GU10 type lamps have a tiny little power supply in them that itself is a bit of a weakness because they've crammed so much into small, such a small space. So not sure, uh, I think I prefer the idea of modular lights that you can actually fix. I've got one here that was sent by Max. Um, but I'll take a look at some point that it was an attempt at that. It's a floodlight that you can actually change the module in. He found it in a skip outside a sort of DIY depot type place. So I get the feeling it had, uh, it had uh, probably failed. And then the replacement was really expensive, more expensive than a complete fitting. Or they'd uh, got sick of replacing the replaceable bits, which is possible. It's one of these things that once the lighting industry has evolved, once it's grown up with the LED lighting, that they will probably standardise on things. A good example of that would be the uh, evolution of these cobs. And this is the uh, flip chip cob on the aluminium flat plate. These evolve quite quickly and you can, because they use a standard fixing, you can just swap them, which is really great news. Right, where was I? Um, next, Neon. Next question, um, Connor Rocker, will you ever do a lab shop tour? You know, one of the things that stops me doing a sort of a walk around the place here or elsewhere is the fact it's a bit of a mess technically. You know, it's clutter everywhere, literally on the floors and everything. It's piles of junk, but good junk. And I just, you know, think, oh, I just feel a bit awkward about stuff like that being seen. Lee, uh, Lee, what's his name, Hobart, knows about that. Lee was visiting the TT from um, Alaska and called by. We met for a coffee and then went for a beer and then he came back here to, to check out the place. So he knows exactly what it looks like. One of the few people that's been in here. I also met Phil Dixon. May actually give a... Uh, Contact Phil and see if it's about because I'll be going into Douglas tomorrow, which is uh, not when this video is being released. I'm not sure. This is a longish video, so it'll take a while to upload. Flow these solder joints together. This is kind of therapeutic. It's one of these things that's quite enjoyable. Once you're into the swing of it, it just feels quite relaxing to to just tinker away and solder stuff up. Uh, where's that bit of solder? The solder is right down to the hilt, so I shall grab another bit of solder. One moment, please. New bit of solder. Next question. Danny Nuki. Clive, I just happened to be at Alton Towers yesterday and everywhere they had some of the crappy lights you rant about. Yes, indeed. Well, that's theme parks for you. They always tend to be a bit run on a budget. And also the people that work there tend to be a bit weird and just perfectly optimised for buying crappy lights to take to bits. Shout out to all the staff at Alton Towers. I have never been to Alton Towers. I should go one day. Been to Blackpool Pleasure Beach on more than one occasion. It's a really wild place, the Blackpool Pleasure Beach. It's a lot of rides jammed into a very small area. Alton Towers is probably a more like a proper theme park. Well, it is a proper theme park. It's quite big. One day I'll get there. So, uh, flow a bit of soda under these. Wet those leads. I wonder how bright this is going to be. It's not going to be super bright. It's certainly not going to be as bright as a LED set of lights. But having said that, it will have that distinctive, characteristic, soft, orangey neon glow, which is quite pleasing. Next question. Uh, TJT22, do you like mechanical engineering? Yes, I like mechanical stuff. I like tinkering with mechanical things. Taking things like compressors and stuff to bits and... I would take the engine in my car to bits, but the risk of uh, it's not the thing to learn on. It's the sort of thing that you'd rather see someone else do it first, just before you render your car non-roadworthy. As many of you have inadvertently, it's what happens.
you just have to think of all the experience when you see people like uh, Eric at South Main Auto or Keith DeFazio uh, doing their mechanical repairs and analysis. You, know, you just know that they've had so much experience to get to where they are now. They are professional mechanics. Here we go. Uh, is it Keith the Fazer? Is that New Level Auto? Can I remember the name of the channel? He does quite complex diagnoses. Always quite therapeutic. Some people say, why do you watch the engineering channels, the mechanical, the mechanics channels? And the answer is, well, same reason they watch the electronics channels. It's just uh, when you're technically inclined, this is your means of recreation. And I've only got a few lights to put on now, so I'm not sure how many I'm going to end up with here, but the nature of this set is such that you can extend it. You can just add more on if you get the whim. Which is good, because I'm now on to the last page of questions. What is the next question? The next question is, a cat. I have a CCTV camera I've installed, and now... Within a 10 foot radius, all radio channels are blocked in my car. That sounds like a noisy switch mode power supply or switching circuitry. They do tend to put out, in some instances, quite broad spectrum noise, as the radio hams will attest to. The, uh, they detest, as well as attesting, because they don't like the power supplies that just jam radio channels. It makes it harder for them to actually get a good, uh, good signal, but then... I suppose part of the fun there is finding filters that will find their way around it. Not so good if it's a broad spectrum interference though. Next question. Hi Clive, what project would you suggest for a dad and a four-year-old? Four-year-old's quite young, but you know what? Apparently I took vacuum cleaners to bits at the age of three, so it's not that young, is it? Uh, not that I'd recommend taking mains appliances apart, but maybe one of the best ways to do that would be to buy toys, cheap toys, uh, from dollar stores or pound shops, just to take to bits. You know, go in, choose the toy together, and then go and take it to bits and play about with the bits inside it. But other than that, soldering is always going to be a bit dodgy, but you could get a breadboard. Um, keep in mind that I started with just lamps and a battery. So maybe that that's also got potential. A four and a half volt battery given to me by my mum with uh, the contacts could be bent in such a way it could trap the lamp and it was when she was in the brownies she'd had this little thing they could make an emergency flashlight out of that and she showed me how to do it and the rest is history it evolved into complex things like polystyrene polystyrene plasticine or play-doh holding the lamp and contacts in place and then discovering parallel and series circuits myself how the lamp was dimmer when you wired two in series. Discovering without really knowing what they were, those things. But that's fine, that's one of the good ways to discover, and it all makes sense later when you do discover what it is. The joys of experimentation at a young age. So yeah, I'd say for a father and kid project, I'd say the cheap toys, take them to bits, just get a cheap screwdriver set and tinker, but uh, make it clear that they don't have to, they shouldn't really be taking other stuff to bits just in case they do. Well, it didn't do me any harm, though I do wonder if that uh, vacuum cleaner was unplugged when I took it to bits. I remember, I was told it was through three that I was took that to bits, but you know what, I do remember taking it to bits. I remember the difficulty I had trying to get the motor back in because the wire had to be rooted in a channel underneath it. That's impressive. It just goes to show you that maybe kids should be introduced to technical subjects at a very young age. I've always said that, you know, when a kid's on a holiday from school, it should join its dad if possible for work experience, but or a mum, uh, just, you know, it, go with its parents. That helps keep the kids out of harm's way and also gives them an education. But health and safety, of course, is just, you know, well, counterproductive that way these days. They don't allow it. Some of the best engineers I've come across started at a very young age. A good example of that would be Peter Rafferty with Hussman. 
He was a big heavy set guy, electrician with Hussman, but he'd started at a young age, well, as an apprentice in the electrical side. And he just made it look so easy. Not just in terms of his understanding and knowledge of the control systems, but also, even though he was big, it, because the refrigeration cases had the drawers that slid out the bottom with the control panels in them, um, he, despite his size, he could go into a sort of like a Buddha position in front of them and comfortably work on them. I couldn't. I had to sort of lie down my side to work on them. It just made it that much harder. He had this technique, he'd just like get busy and it would be done. Lots of talented guys at Hussman. In the Glasgow branch, I'm not sure what happened in the end. I had to stop working for them. I've mentioned this in the past just because the hours were huge and it just got to the point that uh, I was falling asleep at the wheel. And that's not good. That's when you decide, ah, uh, no. Too much travel. It was putting me at risk. It was putting other people at risk. So I thought, that's enough of that then. That's one of the things that they say. They just don't seem to understand. People do fall asleep at the wheel because they're working long hours and also they're being expected to drive massive dis distances. And there's nothing quite like uh, being told, you know, you're going to this job tomorrow and it's miles away that, you know, that really wrecks your sleep pattern. When you're trying to get to sleep, knowing that you're going to have to get up early for a long drive and and you're worried about the job you're going to because it's an unknown variable, that's, uh, that doesn't help at all, does it? Things that people don't speak about. Cars did not give us our freedom. They just uh, made work harder in many ways. Next question. Little Gremlin says, can Wago connectors be used to spur off a socket connection because uh, they're rated 24 amp? Yes, if you're running a spur off a circuit in the UK, the Wago connector should be okay because the cable itself, 2.5 millimeter cable, is rated about 24 amps. So I don't see any problem with using a Wago connector for that. I'm sure that there's some random regulation that says you can't. Mm, so many random regulations and sub rules. Sometimes I think the electrical regulations in the UK are actually just a wee bit bloated. It's a bit of a business. I think that many of the tests that are done are just a wee bit over the top. I'm not sure they actually make any difference to the safety of the installation. Next question. A hired gun asked, is the Duke in the back a Ricola or Seaburg? I think it's a Ricola 443 Duke box. It proudly proclaims on it's got a screen printed legend that is lit from by a fluorescent tube underneath and it says digital integrated circuit technology and it does contain integrated circuit this is back in an era when it was it wasn't a valve or tube based jukebox am amplifier it was a uh, based on transistors and it's back in an era when integrated circuits were the latest thing you know they were really exciting things uh, so they used to, the manufacturers used to brag and say, this contains an integrated circuit, and it did. It contained an 8-pin eight eight dual op-amp, I think was what the integrated circuit was. So it's big brash brag in the front about the integrated circuit technology was just an op-amp, and you think it's a component that would cost you 20p these days. But back then it was something really big. They tended to do that in the, in the sort of jukebox and stuff. They tended to sort of bum them up a little bit, make them sound impressive. The state of the art digital integrated circuit computerized technology. Some soda onto this. I'm putting the longer leads on now because this is the final neon. And then we'll plug it in and see if it all goes bang. Bit more soda in there. Crop these down. Uh, well, I won't plug it in until I've put the, the heat shrink sleeving over. This is where the wire's going to get a bit gangly, not to worry. 
Neon. The last Neon. Uh, in hindsight, it would have been nice seeing if I could find some other Neons. Someone mentioned posting me a neon, some neon lamps recently. They didn't arrive. They get seized or delivered to some random address. I'm very suspicious about the local postal service here. Since I came to the Isle of Man, uh, a lot of items seem to have just gone missing in the post. And it's not the stuff that you, that some items I'm suspicious about them being seized in the post from by customs and excise, but definitely I, I, there are times that, you know, I've had stuff for completely different houses just poked through my letterbox. Then you have to go and find the relevant house, or if it's the other side of the island, then you just repost it. It's a bit odd. Flow this onto the last neon. Flip the neon round. Splash a solder. Yeah, this is probably not going to be too visible for you uh, watching this because it is very small, spindly wires. To get a camera up close to this would have just been probably got in the way. Hmm. Right, looking pretty good. Crop those leads, grip it, and so do the wires on. Then I'll put the heat shrink on all of them. I'll cut them all to size first and then use the heat gun to shrink it all down. So how long has that taken? Uh, it's taken, well, that's almost an hour. It's one of these things that, you know, it wouldn't make sense if you showed these to someone and said, oh, could you make me a set? You'd probably say, uh, no, go make your own. Because uh, it does eat a lot of time. And if you show these things to people and they're so unique and different uh, that they want one, they will generally say, oh, can you make wee one? You're always in that awkward situation that you don't want to say, oh, that takes ages. Because if you make them for one person, then everybody will want them and it can end up taking a lot of time. But if you enjoy it, if you find it therapeutic, then that's not a bad thing. Right. Let's zoom out. It's not that much anyway. Uh, let's crop some bits of sleeving. And then I shall shrink them on. And uh, let's have another question. Um, Jason Robb says, petrol pump display 1990s. Would you like one? Now, I wonder, is that going to be one of these displays, perhaps? Uh, where is a big magnet? These are magnetically actuated. Is this going to flip it? No, it's not. It's just not quite enough magnetism. I'll tell you what is enough magnetism, though. This. Yeah, these displays that had uh, the segments that clicked in and out magnetically. They've got a nice sound to them. I've just picked up loads of the clippings there. That is for another video. They're interesting displays. They're very, very daylight visible, which was the whole point of them. Crop some more bits of this off. And then we shall put them together. Leroy Fairhurst said, what size feet do you have? I am a 14 and struggle to find comfortable safety boots. I have that problem too. My feet are typically... It depends. When you've got big feet, the size between different manufacturers varies. So um, I recently, I've really fancy a pair of the steel toe cap trainers for comfort. But all the ones I've tried so far don't fit. They seem to have a very odd sizing. Right, let's start uh, hitting these up. I'm actually out of questions now, so if this is going to take a bit of time, I may just pause momentarily uh, while I put these on, because otherwise all you're going to hear is a fan as I shrink these on. So I may do that. I may pause while I put these on, and I'll be back in a jiffy so we can test it. That's the sleeves on. I've 
got them ready to test. I just need to strip these wires and test them. I've not tested them yet because I think it's always best to wait for you guys to rejoin me before I test stuff like this. Just in case it goes wrong, because then we can catch the magic moment together. I should add that the, the number of lights in this string is apparently 13. It's just how it ended up. A 13 light string. That also makes it fairly unique. Neon 13. Right, quick test. Well, actually, you know what? I'm not even sure if this will read much. It, it may read much. It may read, read okay. Let's uh, stick it into the hoppy. I should have cropped the leads a little bit shorter for this then, so they don't stick out to a huge degree. Let's uh, crop the leads down and stuff them into the little speaker connectors. And see what the hoppy reads. Which is going to flicker the most, the hoppy or the, the neons? Are the neons flickery? They're a bit shimmery looking. Uh, the hoppy reads 12 milliamps, that's roughly 1 milliamp per neon. So the power consumption of this set of watts, the power factor is about 0.96, which is pretty good. The power is about 3 watts, which is, you know, compared to the old tungsten lights, it's less. Let's uh, take the exposure lock off. Let's focus down onto there and let's turn the light off and see how they look. And then lock the exposure again so it doesn't bounce up and down. They're quite nice. The, the camera is showing them quite generously. That shimmer is because they are little discharge lamps. Uh, they're very visually. They're very nice. It's a very soft orange point of light in each. They're really quite nice. That is good. That's a good result. I like that. I could imagine that being really quite new and exciting at the time when they first uh, sold these uh, sort of like neon-based LED Christmas, uh, neon Christmas lights. That's nice. And they've all lit, and it worked, and it didn't go bang. That's even better. And power consumption, 3 watts for, well, it's roughly, say, what is that per light, then? Uh, 1 milliamp per light. It's, is it quarter watt per light? That is about it. It's about roughly quarter watt per light, which puts it uh, well below even the standard, the old tungsten ones. Not as good as a modern LED lamp because it is basically dropping 240 across the two resistors in the neon, and most of that power will be dissipated across the resistors. Yeah, that's a good result. I like that. Let's uh, turn this light off so we can actually see it in all its neonish glory. Yeah, that's attractive. As I said with the... Uh, well, I'm going to turn the light on again, so I'll just take the exposure off here. Here we go. As I said, this is a... It's kind of... It's a novelty more than anything else. The wiring is single insulated. I don't even know where you'd get double insulated wire for this. It is rated for mains, but uh, to comply with, Euro with European regulations, it would have to be double insulated wire, I think. And it'd also have to have a proper cord grip in these to stop the wires being pulled out. And probably another layer of heat shrink. Maybe you could do it with multiple layers of heat shrink to act as the cord grip. Put a small bit over first at the end and then use the thicker heat shrink over the top. But um, for your own use, for novelty applications, I would say that the little neon lamps are, are quite nice, quite attractive indeed. That worked out really well.